have something to give. Oh, I have something to release upon you. And as I lay my hands upon you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, uh, this is not in a book. This is not in a book. This is glory. It's a transference of spirit. This is not in a university. This is a transference of anointing from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Receive. And you listen to me. Any doctrine, any principle, any law, any teaching that is placed beside the gospel are given more emphasis than the gospel. No matter how harmless it may be in itself, immediately turns into a doctrine of demons. Could you lead us in a few I am's? Today? Absolutely. Okay. Can we all stand? Can we all stand? All right, let's stand. All right. All right. Just repeat after me. I am strong. I am strong. I am healthy. I am healthy. I am confident. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I couldn't see down there, but I'm better for it. You see, I was planted in a dark place where my sight didn't work for me, but I'm better for it. Every time you go through something dark and you can't see your way out, remember you've been planted, not been buried, and when you come up, However you and I may diverge or defer on our opinions of these so-called celebrity preachers such as Stephen Furtick, Mike Todd, Joel Osteen, and so on and so forth, one thing is certain though, there is no biblical teaching at their church. The notion of sin, for instance, is completely absent from their vocabulary. Biblical themes such as holiness, sanctification, are always hard to find in their talk. You might even need a lamp in the middle of the day looking for biblical and theological terms in their sermons that define the wickedness and the poverty of the heart of men. After all, they would not want to make their followers uncomfortable by bringing up terms such as sin, hell, wrath, holiness, sanctification, the narrow way, pick up your cross daily. Why would they do that, right? Such terms though are heart piercing and convicting. The gospel at these churches is replaced by pragmatism. Simply put, what works for their audience or whatever that gets their people going. And they, these false teachers, are consumed by a celebrity mentality, which is telling of their humility or the lack thereof. Despite the obvious points we just mentioned, many people follow them. Now, when I'm talking about many people, I'm talking about millions nationwide and even worldwide. The question still remains though, how do these false teachers do it? And when he gives you clarity, you're going to move out and the anointing of the Lord will tell more shandaras. Come on, come on, give God praise, give God praise. We can see, especially in the book of Colossians, but also Ephesians, we can see in First and Second Timothy, Paul was a steward of the gospel. He was a guardian of the gospel. And you know what he was doing? If you read his epistles carefully, he was not only preaching the gospel, he was constantly, constantly, constantly giving it the preeminence and teaching the church about the preeminence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That of all things, it stands first, because without it, all things fall apart, fall to rubbish, and we find ourselves no longer saved. Do you see this? Bowing the words of Jeremiah in the Bible, God did not send these prophets, yet they have won with their message. God did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in the counsel of God, they would have proclaimed the words of God to the people of God and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. But that's not what they do. This is not what they do. Someone made this comment. The person said, and I quote, from what I've observed, these false teachers really have a way with their words and preaching. It kind of sucks you in but which will ultimately lead you to damnation. When you listen to these guys, 
it really makes you feel good, like really, really good. But what is the end result? The end result is never a life spiritually changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. The person continues and says, from where do these false teachers get this much hype and energy? When you're listening to someone like T.D. Jake or Stephen Freddy, not that I'm telling you to go and listen to them, I have to listen to them since I critique their teachings. You just kind of like feel like they're sucking you in. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Hebrew word is hand, in the hand of the tongue. Now God is the one that gave and delegated that authority. Amen. Amen. For us to use the same power that he uses in the same way he does it. Which authorizes him to go beyond us. Hallelujah. Don't you ever, ever again say, well, after all, I'm only human. You are not only human. No, you're a born again human in the likeness of God with the same privileges as the Lord Jesus Christ. That was powerful. That was awesome. Well, did you, did you recognize that it was heretical? The preaching of the word of God is supposed to be transforming. It is supposed to transform you from whatever you are to who Christ is. You're supposed to be pointed to Christ. Christ is the focal point, not you, not your problems, not whatever you're going through. You're not looking for a breakthrough. You're not looking for a new season of prosperity every single Sunday. You're looking to know Christ more. You're looking to gaze upon the glory of Christ through the revealed word of God in the Bible. But that's not what you're given when you're listening to these false teachers. Now the question remains, how do they suck so many people in? Oftentimes we look at false teachers and false churches and we look at their popularity and we say, these things are happening because we are failing in our discipleship. It's not necessarily the case. And I'm asked that question, I'm frequently asked that question, why is it? Why is it that, that, that God allows these false teacher, teachers to prosper, these false churches to grow. Why, why, I mean, why is it? If I was God, I, I would just like, it's mushroom cloud, man. Just right there in the middle of TV, somebody opens their mouth and tells a lie and then ashes. Why? Why do these false teachers prosper? Why do these false churches grow? The answer is because the Bible is true. Listen to it again. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Having itching, itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves or heap up for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and will wander off into myths. False teachers will prosper and false churches will grow. And it will happen because the Bible is true. Not only do they have so much hype and energy, they come up with the most ludicrous lies someone can come up with in the name of God. Check out Paula White lying about being in front of the throne of God. My spirit went up. And I literally went to the throne room of God. And as I went to the throne room of God, first I saw there was a mist that was coming off the water. And I went to the throne of God. And I didn't see God's face clearly, but I saw the face of God. It wasn't a clear, not like I could see your face clearly. But I knew it was the face of God. Uh, that, that is just ridiculous, obviously. John actually saw Jesus and he fell like a dead man. So did Isaiah and so did Ezekiel. Lying in the name of the eternal God of all and creator of the universe. Yet, these people are praised around the world. Why? Why do so many people love these false teachers? Why do so many people follow them? And even if they are warned over and over and over again about their false teaching and heretical teaching, they still follow them. There are many good things. There are many good ethics. There are many good 
principles. There are many good laws, even in the scriptures. But if your conversation is consumed by something other than the gospel, then you are not understanding scripture. You are not understanding the heart of Paul. You are not understanding the very mind of God. The gospel is not just a doctrine added on to other doctors. It's not just one among many. It is the greatest manifestation of the attributes, the person of God that has ever been given or will ever be given. If you right now were standing in the place of Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, if you were very beholding the very face of God upon the throne, you could not understand him well. You see, earth's problem is how can God judge? Heaven's problem is altogether different. How can God save, pardon wicked men, and still maintain his righteousness? And the answer is in the gospel, where God becomes a man and goes to a tree and bears the sin of his people. And with that sin, the curse, and with that curse, all the holy hatred, all the righteous judgment of God is poured down upon the head of God's Son and He absorbs it. He satisfies justice so it no longer has a demand against God's people. And God can be just and the justifier of wicked men. Never put anything above the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is this happening? Are these people bewitched by these false teachers? What's happening here? Well, for one, we live in the last of the last days. These things must happen. Second of all, these false teachers are very deceiving and they are themselves self-deceived. They are the ones the Lord Jesus Christ described in Matthew chapter 7, who on the last day will say, Did we not prophesy in your name, Lord? In your name did we not cast out demons? It's not as if they actually did the miracles themselves. They are so blinded by their own lies and lust that they truly think that they are on their way to heaven. Third of all, many people who follow these false teachers are under the power of the spirit of deception. It's as if these people want to be deceived. Paul, in fact, talked about these kinds of people in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they, these people, will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers. They will appoint for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. They will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths, to fables, to lies. They will detest and despise pure and biblical doctrines that address their sin, that address their depravity, that address their wickedness, that address their life of compromise. And how do we respond? By continuing to preserve and proclaim the gospel and by continuing to endure the suffering that will come inevitably as a result. And one of the ways that this leads to that kind of suffering is this. There is a world out there that hates the gospel because they love their sin. And we're seeing this right now today. They hate the gospel because they love their sin. And the gospel is proclaimed, but then there are false teachers who are scratching itching ears and for example same-sex marriage there are people out there who are now moving away from preserving the truth and basically are saying you know what I, I am a Christian and Christianity is wrong I am embracing this lifestyle and the world says yes the enlightened ones and the end result is those who are holding fast to the truth 
are now further marginalized as people say, this is real Christianity because they're open, affirming, and tolerant, and you are absolutely not like Jesus because you are a hateful bigot. Anybody? Anybody heard that? Anybody been? Okay. This is a prime example of what we're talking about. A real, right here, right now example of what we're talking about. What are you going to do? Are you going to continue to preserve and proclaim or try to find some way to alleviate the pain through compromise? And, and that's, that's just one of many examples. But here's what we know. People are not saved by hearing that which pleases them. Unless that which pleases them is the gospel. Amen? And so what is desperately needed in our age, as in the apostolic age, is those who will Preserve and proclaim the gospel and in turn endure the suffering that will come inevitably as a result of doing so. And as we make disciples, we have to hold these two things together. What is the heart of discipleship? The heart of discipleship is taking one under our wing somehow and saying to them, here's the gospel that you must preserve. Here's the gospel that you must proclaim. And oh, by the way, let it sink deep in you because as you preserve it and as you proclaim it, suffering will come your way. And the only way that you will endure it is by the power of God, through the power power of God as this gospel saturates your whole life. That's the heart of discipleship. This is it for this video and I hope you guys enjoyed it and found it helpful. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below and make sure to share it with a friend. Make sure to join our channel by becoming a member today by clicking the join button. Become a Patreon member and help us spread the gospel of Christ through this channel around the world. If this is your first time on the channel, I hope you subscribe. If not, I hope to see you in our next video. And with love in Christ, John Henry with the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm.